Hello, Rascals. It's Miss Martinez, and I have a story to read to you today. And I chose this particular one uh, for Women's History Month. And this is Who Says Women Can't Be Computer Programmers? The Story of Ada Lovelace. And it's written by Tanya Lee Stone and illustrated by Marjorie Priceman. I hope you enjoy this book. Who Says Women Can't Be Computer Programmers? The Story of Ada Lovelace. Here's the dedication page for everyone who thinks outside the box. On the outskirts of a lovely village in County Kent, England, down a long driveway lined with lime trees, lived a young girl with a wild and wonderful imagination. As Ada was often left alone, she grew quite good at entertaining herself with interesting ideas. Ada's cat, whom she named Madam Puff, was an attentive audience Unlike Ada's mother, Madame Puff never issued her the reward of a paper ticket when she did well, and never took the ticket away when she was thought to be bad. And Madame Puff never ever made her stand in a dark closet until she promised to behave. Ada's mother, Lady Byron, wasn't trying to be mean. In her own way, she was hoping to protect her daughter, protect her from what Lady Byron believed were the dangers of a vivid imagination, such as her late father had. <clears throat> Ada's father was Lord Byron, a world famous poet who was also as famous for his bad behavior as he was for his poetry. Before Ada's parents had been married a year, Lady Byron got so fed up with him, she wrapped her baby girl in a warm blanket and moved back into her parents' house. Ada was only five weeks old. A few months later, owing enormous sums of money, Lord Byron leaped into a gilded coach he hadn't paid for, raced to the coast, scrambled onto a ship setting out for France, and he fled England. He never saw his daughter again. Lady Byron decided the best way to make sure Ada didn't grow up to have a wild imagination like her father was to train her to think like a mathematician. So she hired tutors for Ada from the time she was four. By the time she was eight, Ada's nimble mind was soaking up music, French, and math more than six hours each day. Despite all the studying and the unfortunate fact that she was often ill, the fiery Ada was interested in lots of other things too, drawing, writing, singing, and playing the piano and the violin. When Ada was 12, she became consumed with the idea of designing a flying machine in the shape of a horse and crafting wings for herself, modeling them after bird wings. But instead of giving Ada the bird drawing books she asked for, Lady Byron increased Ada's hours of math study. Lady Byron was also determined to tame her feisty daughter and make sure Ada married a suitable man. In the eight, early 1800s, it was extremely difficult even for well-educated women like Lady Byron to picture anything more for a daughter than to become a proper lady and wife. When Ada was almost 18, Lady Byron presented her to the royal court. Ada enjoyed curtsying for the King William and Queen Adelaide in her white satin and tulle gown. But it was a different kind of gathering they attended that Ada found much more intriguing. A fascinating scientist named Charles Babbage liked to surround himself with interesting people. He had a reputation for throwing loud parties at his house people would crowd in for the love, lively conversation and to see what new contraption Babbage might show off next.
by 1833, there were already basic calculators that could do simple problems such as 2 plus 3 equals 5, 100 plus 300 equals 400. But Charles Babbage had invented a machine he called the difference engine, which could do automatic calculations up to 20 or even 30 numbers long, such as 1,769, oops, sorry, let me start, try that again, 1,769,462 minus 348,250 equals 1,421,212. Those are long numbers. On the night Ada met Charles, he talked about his machine as a child does its plaything. 12 days later, they met again. So Charles could demonstrate the model that he had built. Ada was enchanted by the beauty she saw in his invention. This was a major turning point for Ada. She was excited to realize that math and imagination did not have to be opposites, as her mother had wanted so desperately to impress upon her. They actually went together. Ada saw in Charles a person with whom she could discuss ideas. A great friendship started to grow. Dozens of letters went back and forth between them, and they would visit each other, likely walking and talking math and philosophy. As for the difference engine, building the entire thing turned out to be too expensive, but Charles' mind was already racing toward an even better idea, a new machine that could do any kind of math calculation based on instructions it was given. He called it the analytical engine. Charles had seen a weaving loom called the Jacquard loom, which used cards with specifically placed holes punched in them. Each card told the loom what color thread or designed to weave next. The Jacquard loom was able to weave complicated patterns in cloth. Some of the designs even looked like paintings. Perhaps most important, there was no limit to what the punch cards could instruct the loom to do. Here you see the punch cards. Here you see the loom. And here you see what the loom has created on the different kinds of materials. Charles knew he could adapt this punch card system to give his math machine unlimited instructions. This was something entirely new in the world of calculations. His engine was also capable of doing things Charles himself did not yet comprehend. But Ada did. She was familiar with how the Jacquard loom worked, and she understood mathematics. Those things, combined with what she called the fair white wings of imagination, made it possible for Ada to see the unseen worlds around us. She understood that the engine would be able to weave numbers. And as she later wrote, just as the Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves, it can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. <clears throat> Ada was the perfect person to help Charles get some much needed attention and money for his invention, so he could afford to actually build it. When Charles went to Europe to talk about his engine, he and another mathematician wrote a paper about it, but it was in French. This was Ada's opportunity to help. She translated the paper into English and showed it to Charles. His reaction surprised her. I asked why she had not herself written an original paper. I then suggested that she should add some notes. As smart and sassy as Ada was, the idea had never crossed her mind. In the 1800s, women simply didn't do things like write scientific papers, but of course, she set right to it.
Throughout this time, Ada was often ill. She pressed on anyway with a passion for the project that turned up in many of her letters to Charles. No more for tonight, for I can neither talk, write, nor think. And yet I feel more like a fairy than ever. There she is in her bed writing and writing the notes. When she was done, her notes were twice as long as Charles' original paper, and her notes became much more famous. For Ada had envisioned and then described what Charles hadn't realized. His analytical engine not only had the power to process numbers, but it would be able to create things like pictures and music, just as computers do today. Charles never raised the money he needed for his invention, but if the analytical engine had been built at the time, it's quite possible that the entire age of computers would have begun more than 100 years earlier than it did. And in large part, we would have Ada with her brain of a mathematician and her imagination of a poet to thank. In the end, Here's a whole bunch of more interesting information about Ada Lovelace's life, which you can read if you check this book out from our school library. I hope you've enjoyed this read aloud. Who says women can't be computer programmers? Well, I say anyone can be computer programmers. Have a fabulous afternoon. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, bye-bye.